it is a deep, mysterious kind of eye. The sea king is not the true god of things, because actually he is a phase of Emma'e, the lord of the dead. The sea king rules in a subterranean world like Poseidon, who is not the great deity, but like the Titan Ocean, is one of the ancient beings. And this ancientness of beings has to do with the traditional descent from generation to generation of the evolving or unfolding consciousness of the human being. So for all practical purposes, let us say at this time that the seeking represents the mysterious self locked in the very depths of our existence, locked in a strange world, a world that perhaps the yogi or the disciple of Vedanta approaches in his samadhi, a world of absolute peace. Perhaps again this sea king's paradise may be likened to Amitabha's blessed region. Anyway, it is the abode of the evening calm within man, the abode of utter quietude to be achieved by meditation for the strange doctrines of Zen, for the mysterious rites and rituals of Tantra and Shingong and Tendai, all the magic of the eternal stillness of great peace within man. Now a young fisherman probably plays the part of the truth seeker. He is almost another Parsifal, a guileless fool. Parsifal shoots a swan in the forest of Mansovat. Our young fisherman, Urshima, catches the turtle of long life, an ancient and religious symbol of both China and Japan. The turtle becomes his helper and teacher, his Gurnamons or Merlin. We have another kind of thinking. We have the turtle as the symbol of wisdom, wisdom which will carry the young man on his back to the abode of peace. And to achieve this, the young fisherman must be carried over the vast oceans of illusion in order to come finally into the palace of the sea king. We have almost parallel illustrations of this in the Rosicrucian ritual of the chemical marriage of Christian Rosencrantz. Here we have, instead of this, we have a magic garden, like the garden of the troubadours, where all strange uh, beings live. And in the midst of this garden, which is the, the garden of the shut palace of the king, which corresponds in alchemy with the sea king, we have the wonderful virgin of the world who corresponds to the daughter. Here we also have the introduction of Otohime, which uh, actually is a psyche or soul symbol. Here the young man, uh, coming out of worldliness, uh, in a kind of strange daze or trance, has attempted the mysterious journey inward, the journey of meditation and contemplation. He is trying to cross the great sea of illusion and has done so on the back of the sage which represents the eternal wisdom of mankind and of his kind in general. When he gets to this mysterious place in palace, he discovers that all dimensions and directions of space meet there. He finds himself in a place in which all the seasons that we know are imposed together to form one eternal season that is all beautiful. These seasons represent the cycle of the Nidanas, the cycle of birth, growth, maturity, and decay, the four ages of man, the mysterious beginnings and the spring and the summer and the autumn of things. All this is gathered together in a an experience of psychic consciousness. So we have, as in the alchemical and hermetic rites, we have the union of the truth seeker 
uh, and the daughter of the sea king. This union is the identification of the personality with the soul. It is the outer life becoming enamored of the inner life. The outer life, the fisherman, corresponds to Dante. The inner life to Beatrice who became the great psychic inspiration of his existence. And we know that the historical Beatrice was only a phantom of the psychic mysticism which Dante built around the concept. So we find the outer person united in strange ritual and ceremony to the conscious soul. And there, having attained uh, a psychic initiation or a psychic liberation, we find the self more or less identified with the objects of the self. But now something of a rather insidious nature seems to step into this little drama. The individual within himself finds in a strange way that this spiritual experience does not satisfy him. What he has failed to do is to recognize uh, that his aspiration has not overcome the limitation of himself. He is like St. Paul, who would, whenever he would do good, evil was nigh unto him. This aspiration of the individual was not strong enough to raise him completely above the limitations of his human perspective. He longed to be one with truth, but he was bound to the old ways of things, perhaps by the pressure of an ancient karmic tie. And for the little village and his parents and his brothers and sisters and his neighbors and their fish, fishing ships were all symbols of attachment, attachment to mortality, attachment to physical existence. And the Buddhist explains this very simply, that the individual, while given this glorious vision of possibilities, was still bound by the inability uh, to live free of the attachments of the mortal state. It is as though for a second he had glimpsed a universal mystery. The mystery closed in again, and darkness resulted, and he fell back upon his own humanity. So the uh, Buddhist would simply say that this person had a mystical experience, that this mystical experience was not strong enough to bind him completely to eternity. He wanted to live forever in the golden palace of the sea king. He wanted to live forever in the love of his own soul and have an immortal existence beyond birth and death. But he was not by nature immortal. He was by nature a mortal creature. Therefore, by his own mortality, he wished himself to die. Regardless of anything that could have been done, he could not escape from his own mortality. Now this is a very important Buddhist philosophic point, which certainly has become gradually involved within the story. Urushima, the fisherman, represents the human personal being that has never known immortality and never can. It has, it has no consciousness apart from condition. Separated from a conditioned existence, it dwells in an utter bewilderment. Born into the presence of eternal peace, it cannot exist there, because within itself there is only longing, desire, fear, hope. Every part of the personal self is built of personal factors. It belongs to this world. It was created here. And with it are our ambitions, our hopes for wealth, our search for satisfaction, our desires to dominate our neighbors, to become influential citizens, 
we measure our entire life from the cradle to the grave. Therefore, something that does not belong in this pattern of cradle to grave simply is not comprehensible to us. We think it is. We believe it is. We dream of immortality. But even heaven will become a hell if the creature that inhabits it is bound by karma to its own ignorance. This is part of the of one of the ancient sutras of the great king, where it tells clearly that the individual can only be happy when he is totally united within his own being. Wherever there is stress or striving, division, a divided allegiance, the individual is torn. And wherever there is illusion, there is division. Wherever the individual mistakes the common world for the eternal world and tries to live in both, he falls into the disaster of the fisher lad. So because of this fact that he cannot fully experience uh, that which is not of his own nature, we have a reverse here of the European story of Undine. In Undine, it is the nymph, the water nymph, that cannot adjust. And in many of the uh, elemental stories of the Middle Ages, there is a final division in which the submundane or the unearthly thing has to return to its own nature. It cannot be forever mortal, forever human, forever remain in this world. Now the story is reversed. Now the superhuman being is in its own element. But now the human being cannot attain that element and, re and remain there. There is a difference, and that difference is in some way the difference between the land and the sea. The difference between the individual who breathes air and the individual who breathes the eternal waters of life, which are now a strange, mysterious symbol of the continual breathing of immortality. So, uh, regretfully, but inevitably, Otohime, the soul, has to give up her lover. And down the back of the ancient turtle, he returns again to the world he has known. Now, in this story, we have two different versions. According to one version, he was gone three years. And um, in the world, it was 300 years. In another version of the story, we find a, t a completely different time equation in which the uh, equation is that the young man uh, has been away for a very long time and comes back to find nothing changed and the situation utterly endurable in this world. There are the two versions of the story. But whichever version you wish to take, the principle involved is the same. What happens to the individual who has had a glimpse of reality? He is strangely and desperately placed because he is no longer the citizen of one world or of another. He goes back to the attachments of life signified by his family and his community, and he finds that these attachments have died. There are no persons that have died by necessity. They are relationships. He finds that all of the things that meant a great deal to him have passed away. That really has been gone a very long time in spiritual experience, if not in time. The old priest will tell you that in a moment of inner meditation, the individual may truly live a thousand years. And out of a moment of insight, he may return to a world that can never be the same, because the world is the same only because he is the same. The moment he is not the same, the world must change. So our fisherman comes back, but he has changed somewhat himself. He can no longer be united with the world he left behind, he can no longer quite reach out uh, to this other world 
where the seasons mingle, till he is totally alone. He is alone except for people who say that somewhere, sometime, there was such a person as himself. Here we have a hint of rebirth. Here we have a, a symbolism of the great passing of karmic time. And at last, the young fisherman wanders back again to the shore of the sea. He comes back again to the mysterious symbol of eternity. And here he is confronted with the box. Now the story of Pandora's box has become a classic, and there is much to suspect that perhaps this box not only inspired the caskets and the story of the merchant of Venice, but also supplied the mysterious story for the story for the legend of the sea king and his palace. It's interesting to remember and bear in mind, of course, that in all this excitement with all these things going on, the sea king himself was never seen, only his palace and his daughter. The mysterious being that abides in the depths of the, of the mysterious sea of either illusion or reality is utterly invisible. So the young man walks to the shore of the sea and cries out for the turtle, for the symbol of the wisdom, but it does not come. Perhaps if he waited, it might have. Perhaps if he had kept his faith, Clear and clear, and held on, enduring without doubt, he might have gone back to the sea king's house. But in his desperation, he turned to this mysterious box, the treasure that his soul had given him, the treasure that he must keep forever locked. The Shingong and Tendai master will tell you what this treasure is. This treasure is the key to the secret arts. This is the treasure of the mystic and spiritual formula, the strange mantra magic, the symbol of the mysterious living power, the word, the lost word, the eternal truth, which if man will keep this in his heart and never pervert it, never break his oath or obligation, that he must not open that box. He must never release out into manifestation those things which belong to his own inner life. He must never pervert the truth which has been given to him. If he kept this, he might have been able to go back. But in his desperation, he opened the box hoping to find therein the magic way of returning to happiness. Well, what kind of a box could it be? We are all seeking for peace. We are all seeking for happiness. And like Pandora opening her box, we have launched a pestilence upon our kind. For in our search for peace, we have used everything we could think of except the path of reality. We have tried to drink ourselves into a stupor. We have turned to narcotics and sedation. We have surrounded ourselves with the most strange and exciting and disastrous emotional tempos in order to, to find something that we are seeking and we do not know what it is. What we are seeking for is peace. And we are destroying ourselves with confusion while we are striving after quiet. In any event, the release of this secret thing, of this breaking of the primary obligation to be true to truth, to be true to the soul and all that it stands for, to be true to the psychic wisdom that has been granted, brings Hiroshima back suddenly back to the old world which he has left. There is no longer any hope for him to go on. He can only go down into the earth, and suddenly he is very old, he is very tired, the world goes dark around him, and he passes out of embodiment. 
So uh, in this particular phase of the story, in all probability, it also has a Buddhistic interpretation. For it has to do with the final dissolution of the personality. The personality itself is wiped away in some strange manner. Uh, the individual forever undoes himself. The mistakes, the selfishness, the corruption destroy that which they fashion. So in the end, the personality simply perishes. Now in the legend, we know no more that goes beyond this point. There is nothing more said to indicate what could lie beyond. According to the beliefs of the people, however, the very village to which this ancient fisherman is said to have belonged, his soul would go forth in time to a new embodiment, and his psychic life would continue and unfold again. Uh, but uh, the mysterious happening that occurred at that particular time would not be repeated. Because in that particular experience, something happened that was very interesting. Buddhism and Shintoism would both explain it something in this way. The whole vision represented a psychic happening, a dream, which occurred within Urashima himself. It was never anything but an inner experience. The palace of the sea king was in himself. Everything was a matter of attitude. Everything was a matter of belief or conviction. The whole universe, the ocean, and all that is in it is, is in man. For it can never mean anything to man except what it does mean to man. Every part of man is interpreted by himself. His consciousness can only mean what it does because he interprets it that way. An enemy is only an enemy because man himself creates that enemy. Another man is only a friend because we create that friend. And it is uh, true also in the Buddhist belief where these people say, if there were no man, there would be no Buddha. The Buddha the symbol of the most complete enlightenment of man, is man's symbol of his own enlightenment. Everything originates in man. It is man locked within the instrument of his own interpretation, trying to explain beyond the circumference of himself, and always forced to fall back upon himself for the very substance of his interpretation. He has no other source. So our whole drama is a drama of man's interpretation of a situation or a condition. The sea is man's uh, ignorance, his partial knowledge, that knowledge which is often more painful than a lie. Because in this sea, uh, the individual lives by half-truth. And these half-truths have the very substance of death in them. And in his little boat, which is itself grotesquely fashioned, this boat might be his own individuality by which he isolates himself from the sea, for without that he would drown in himself. For there is no other place he can drown, the sea is in himself. In any event, as he is there, there comes out of the subconsciousness of himself, the wisdom animal, the ahat, the lohan, the senin, the mysterious powers which man himself fashions. But what are these powers? They are the touches of intuition by means of which he suddenly has a glimpse beyond himself. In Buddhism, all emotions are divisible into two kinds those that arise in illusion and those that arise in reality. All that arise in illusion must die. All that arise
rise in reality increase as illusion dies. A good example of an emotion arising in illusion is ambition because it has no substance. It can never be a reality. It can never be more than emotion, a transitoriness, fame for a day, reward for a moment, and then silence. As opposed to this, we say that appreciation is an emotion arising from reality. But the greater we become in truth, the more we appreciate. The more we overcome ignorance, the more we appreciate. Therefore, as we grow, appreciation and understanding mingle to make us better. Therefore, it is an emotion that arises out of reality itself. And we are permitted four emotions arising out of reality. In a sense, our friend the turtle signifies this intuitive emotion of reality. It is wisdom which must always increase as ignorance ceases. A man within himself has a moment of intuitional insight. Out of the depths of his own psyche arises a dream experience of aspiration, a dream experience of his seeking to be free from the dream itself. A man dreaming that he dreams and then trying to dream that he awakes from the dream. A compound dream, one within another. And in this mysterious inner dream within the other dream, as in Hamlet, the play within the play, he is taken to the home of the sea king. He is taken into the most distant and marvelous part of himself. And for a moment he experiences the absolute transcendency of equilibrium. He finds what the yogic exercise of samadhi produces. For as one of the old scriptures of Buddhism says, he experiences the nirvana. It's the complete suspension of all that is not good. But only true infinite life, infinite love, infinite wisdom remain. So in this we have the little story of the sea king and his wonderful world of joy and peace. And we find in this also that man stirs the inner part of himself and finds another being in there. And this other being that he finds is his own psychic nature. He finds that there is something inside of himself that has been growing with him. And this is his own soul. For the soul is the better part of his own experience. It is that which experience has taught. It is the gradual experience of growth, of realization, of unfoldment, and of the cultivation of the great uh, emotional realities. And this uh, emotional growth in Buddhism is the power that is usually presented through the form of the feminine version of the Kannan Bodhisattva, the deity of infinite compassion. Actually, the Kannan is again the product of man. Were it not for the human mind, there could be no Kannan. This is merely the way in which the human being it personifies, embodies, or defines the mysterious impulse to compassion, to infinite love and patience within himself. A man living every day selfishly, unconcerned about the realities of life, suddenly sees a child struck in an accident. He rushes to the street takes the child in his arms and experiences a great personal tragedy, although he has never seen the child before. In that moment, his only thought is to help that child, to bring peace to it, to help to find a quick remedy, take it to the nearest doctor, find the hospital. And at the same time, a great hurt is in his own heart. He has great pity, although he has not previously experienced it. 
And then, of course, the Buddhist faith. This means that in that moment, this man is experiencing the mysterious, subtle, internal emotion of the Bodhisattva Jizo, the, the pity for the little one. All these arise in the person, and the person finds his own symbolic vestments for them just as the Christian sees in the uh, vision of Christ that arises in his life, uh, the symbol of the absolute sacrifice of, of a great and noble being for the re re reformation and restoration of mankind. So all these are symbols arising in the individual. And in his inner dream, within a dream, uh, the little fisherman finds at last, theoretically, that which he seeks. He has everything. But he's in a strange conflict because he has everything, but he is not everything himself. This fact that he is not that which he has, that he has not gained this insight uh, through the full experience but has gained it only through an inner dream, psychic situation. Things that outwardly he has not yet attained the power to transform a dream to a reality. But there is this moment in the mysticism of the East where perhaps the dream takes over. Where the individual one moment says, I am dreaming. And in this next moment, he is the dream. He has stepped through the mysterious Tory gate, the gate where there is no wall. And uh, the reality has changed places with the unreality. And the dreamer has now only the power to dream back upon what he previously thought was real, and that has now become unreal. But in the story of our little fisherman, this situation does not follow through. He is unable, actually, within his own psychic experience, to hold the attitude uh, that he really wants to hold. This is uh, explained very well in the stories of the Arhats. For in the stories of these saintly persons, there was this tremendous struggle to the final attainment of liberation from worldliness. For it is only by that liberation that a hero uh, could be free from the longing to go back to the village. Uh, the Arhat is the one who has finally achieved this perfect detachment so that subconsciously he is attached, not just consciously. He may say, I will never go back, but in his consciousness he may be dying of loneliness and wanting to go back. So the change has to be in consciousness, or else it is not real. It, it doesn't change the, the psychic integration of the person. And in this instance, the young man had to go back. And going back was really nothing more than re-entering into the realm of objective attachments, objective realities. He had an experience of another kind, but to him it was a dream. He was never able to make the change which would have made his village the dream, of the temple of the sea king the reality. He was not able to repolarize his own relation to the dream. Now in Buddhism this is a very simple problem essentially, because it doesn't make any difference which way you polarize it. It is still a dream. The palace of the sea king has no more reality than the village you left by the shore of the sea, but no less. Therefore you are divided between two kinds of unreality, the unreality of mortality and the unreality of immortality. You are suspended between them. But in the Mariana school it is pointed out that all things living in this world must be under an illusion of some kind, because they do not possess the material, the fabric, to escape the illusion. But they have a choice. They can be under a beautiful dream or a terrible dream. 
The problems of existence as we know them end finally in a terrible dream. Materialism, uh, degeneracy, selfishness, hate, fear, all these end in a terrible dream. Man has made a false world of horror for himself. He may escape from this to another kind of dream, the dream of Armida's western paradise, the dream of beauty, the dream of peace and of love and of friendship. He may experience the universe from a new level of himself. What the universe really is, he does not know. But he does have the power to take from the universe its power to hurt him and replace that power by the, by the power of the universe to bless him. He creates them both. But to the degree that he is, and has a great insight, he becomes a creator of beauty. And to the degree that he becomes a creator of beauty, he brings beauty and peace into his own life. But Hiroshima said the world is beautiful, everything is lovely, this is paradise, but I still want the way of earth. I want personal affection. I want to love somebody and I want to hate somebody. I, don't, I can't stand this strange, mysterious loneliness of always being good. We went back. Suddenly he was very old and very tired, very exhausted of all material things, and he went to sleep for the shore of the great ocean. And his understanding of the ocean was part of the dream. For the ocean is nothing but karma, a strange motion rising from cause and going to effect. Man is a stream of karma moving from eternity to eternity. All these th uh, arisings within himself are the products of his own insight, of his own liberation. He may not at this stage be capable of understanding the absolute, but he can choose between the life of goodness and the life of pain. But he must make the choice all the way through, because if he does not, his own imaginative creativity cannot vitalize his dream. He cannot believe the beautiful illusion unless he has outgrown his attachment to the illusion that is not beautiful. So inside himself he has to create a new world of beauty. And he does this only by the unfoldment of the integrities, beauties, and values within himself. All of these legends and all of these stories, whether Greek, Egyptian, Persian, Indian, Chinese, Japanese, all have to do with the power of man to create a world according to his heart's desire, and then to inhabit the world that he has created by the purity of his own attitudes. If he is unable to hold this, he is again destroyed. For it is told in the Buddhist fable that a great and noble king had lived most wisely and nobly. And when his time came to die, his virtues were so great that he was transferred to Indra's paradise, there to have palaces and retinue and all the joys that were the proper reward of a noble kingship during his lifetime. And after he had been there for a while, the king said, Well, I guess I must have been pretty good to deserve all this. And at that instant, he passed into perdition. The individual, heaven is the heaven of his own insight. If he is right, if he is true, he dwells in the light. If one selfish or unkind or cruel thought comes to him, he suddenly finds himself standing on the edge of the sea with a village that has forgotten him on the one hand and a sea that he cannot conquer on the other. The moment he takes out of his heart the mysterious vision, the wonderful soul picture 
of that which can be, who is left alone to grow old and die by the shores of the ocean. For the ocean is the mysterious substance from which all dreams are fashioned, the ocean of our own unconscious, within which we create heavens and hells and then have to live in them. But it is during our intelligent efforts to grow here and now that we fashion the instruments to remold our own private universes. And when our own private universes become suitable for the habitation of righteous beings, then we will dwell in them present, uh, pleasantly and happily. But when all we have earned is a cycle of compensations, then we must suffer a little, enjoy a little, hope a little, and fear a great deal. These are the mysteries of the sea of illusion, the oceans of reality, and the individual who dreams true only when he is able to vitalize that dream with the full integrity of his own consciousness. Otherwise, he dreams of beauty and awakens to the same drab world he left before. But the only reason the world he awakens to is drab is because he is drab. The only reason he has to wake out of, re of beauty into cruelty is because there is a cruelty in himself that will not permit him to continue to awaken in beauty. All these are the compensations within self. And when these things are understood, we will be the master of most of the fables that have been written by mankind. Well, thank you very kindly. I think time's up.